Member statements. Uh, the member from uh, Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On Friday, May 3rd, I had the honour of attending a ceremony at the Peterborough Armouries to name a bridge on Highway 115 after an OPP officer. May 3rd was chosen for the ceremony because on that date in 1928, Provincial Constable Norman F. Maker was called to attend a disturbance with a possible weapon at the Montgomery House Hotel in Peterborough. My paper is sticking together. When the officers arrived, the suspect fled up a flight of stairs to his room. PC Maker and his partner pursued the suspect up the stairs, and the suspect emerged from his room with a handgun. The suspect proceeded to discharge his weapon, killing Norman and wounding his partner. PC Norman Maker was the third OPP officer officially killed in the line of duty in Ontario's history. Norman Maker was only 32 years old. He was survived by his wife, Muriel, and their two daughters, Norma, who was three, and Connie, who was only three months old. All of this came to light when Norman's oldest daughter, Norma, passed away on December 4, 2021, and her obituary told the story of her father. From that obituary, the Peterborough Detachment started the work to honour PC Maker. They found the newspaper reports of his, and his official death certificate to validate the story. And on May 3rd of this year, the 96th anniversary of the day the PC Maker was, was killed, he was finally honoured. Norman F. Maker, a hero in life, not in death. Thank you very much. Next, we have the member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. Originally, workers' compensation was designed to make up for the loss of income, including retirement pension income, when a worker becomes permanently disabled because of their work. But this has not been the case for years. In 1998, the Mike Harris government cut WSIB retirement contributions from 10 to 5 percent and reduced the loss of income amount from 90 to 85 percent. The result? Poverty, when an injured worker reaches retirement age. In today's world, many people choose or are forced to work well past the age of 65, but the WSIB ceases compensation at age 65 regardless of circumstances. This is age discrimination. And then there is the lump sum payment at age 65 that skews an injured worker's income for a year, raises their taxes, and makes them ineligible to apply for other supports. Legislating poverty for injured workers while giving away $1.5 billion of so-called surplus to employers is unconscionable. If this government is truly working for workers, they will bring the WSIB back to its original purpose compensation for as long as the disability lasts, security of benefits and retirement income, and no cost to the public. This is necessary, it's possible, and it must be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member Statements. The member for Oakville North, Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. One of my favourite things this time of year is to get out and support all the worthwhile charity runs, hikes and walks that take place in Oakville, North Burlington and across our community. To highlight just a few, I recently participated in the Run for Lighthouse, which raised over 250000 Now in their 25th year, Lighthouse in Oakville offers grieving children, youth and their families a place to receive grief support and to connect with others following the death of a loved one. And just this past weekend, I joined Carpenter Hospice Hike. Carpenter Hospice, located in the heart of Burlington, opened their doors over 20 years ago. And today, this 11-bedroom hospice has welcomed over 3,000 people as they go through their end-of-life journey. Coming up on June 15th, I will be joining hundreds of people for the Heartache to Hope 5K Walk to Remember along Bronte Heritage Waterfront Park. Heartache to Hope provides healing support to children, teens and adults who've experienced the death of a loved one by suicide. Speaker, these are just a few of the many charity runs that take place over the summer in our community. Each play a vital role and staff and volunteers deserve to be recognized for the compassionate care they provide. 
Thank you for fostering a spirit of community while raising valuable funds for these worthwhile causes. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Niagara Centre. Uh, thank you, Speaker. This, I received a letter this month from Bart Coleman, pastor of St. Matthew's Lutheran and Welland and First Lutheran in Port Coburn, highlighting the staggering number of people using food banks in Niagara. They wanted to know what the government was doing to address this crisis. I had no answer for them. Food banks receive very little government support. They depend on charity and are barely hanging on these days. John Braithwaite, CEO of the Hope Centre in Welland, will tell you they continue to see a steady increase in clients. He also noted 2,364 Wellanders used their food bank for the very first time last year. They struggle to ensure they have enough food on the shelves and cannot keep up with the demand. With social assistance rates remaining well below the poverty line, this government continues to legislate poverty in Niagara and across Ontario. Christine Clark Lafleur is the CEO of Port Cares in Port Coburn. She says that food banks like Port Cares are seeing families that used to donate food now have become clients. Speaker, while well, food banks are on the brink of collapse and cannot keep pace with the growing need in our communities, this government is handing over a billion dollars to corporations in order to put beer in corner stores one year er earlier than it was already scheduled to happen. What a cruel and twisted sense of priorities. What a slap in the face to those who are on social assistance, as well as those who work every day to help feed hungry families in our communities. Let's hope this government rethinks its priorities. How can you trust a government that puts early access to beer in corner stores ahead of access to food and shelter for its poorest citizens? Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you, Speaker. Colleagues, I want to share two recent important events in the great riding of Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. You tell. On May 25th, I was in Wyerton to attend a wonderful ceremony for the unveiling of the Cenotaph Restoration. Mm. The Cenotaph in Wyerton is located right downtown on Burford Street, a few blocks south of Royal Canadian Legion Branch 208. The town of South Bruce Peninsula and the Legion worked together on the restoration project and commissioned Sylvia Pakoda to create a beautiful tribute to our soldiers including Indigenous soldiers who fought to give us all the freedoms we enjoy today. There were many in Wyerton to see the unveiling firsthand, including local residents, veterans, and representatives from Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. Congratulations to all who helped us make this great event possible. Then this past Friday, it was my pleasure to be in Dundalk with representatives of the Blue Water District School Board members of Southgate Council and the Minister of Education to announce the construction of a new Dundalk Elementary School. Dundalk has been growing very substantially over the past several years with many new families and new homes. The new school will accommodate 735 students, include 54 licensed childcare spaces, and have great recreational facilities. This will be a $28 million investment. Thank you to the Dundalk for community for being a vibrant and going presence. Thank you to the school board and, and council, and thank you, Minister Lecce, for your incredible support of the great people of Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Well done. Well done. I recognize the member for London West on a point of order. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to wear the kaffiyeh that was gifted to me by London's Muslim and Palestinian community during my member's statement. Member for London West is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to wear a kafia during her member's statement. Agreed? No. I heard some no's. I recognize the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, this morning I met with representatives of the National Council of Canadian Muslims to discuss the urgent need for legislation to address rising Islamophobia and anti-Palestinian racism in Ontario. June 6 will mark three years since the heinous act of hate-motivated terrorism that took the lives of four members of London's Afzal family in 2021, shaking our community to its core. While the London terror attack was the most deadly incidence of Islamophobia in Ontario, it was certainly not the first. And in the three years since, 
We have seen an alarming intensification of Islamophobia and anti-Palestinian racism, especially in the wake of the violence in Gaza, in our schools, on our streets, and in our communities. In 2022, I was proud to co-sponsor our London Family Act, legislation that sets out comprehensive measures to proactively combat Islamophobia and all forms of hate. Shockingly, the government refused to allow the bill to be debated, saying it would be studied in instead and brought back. Two years later, there has been no study, no legislation, no opportunity for debate, and no increased protection from harassment, discrimination, and hate. Speaker, all, de all Ontarians deserve to feel safe in their workplaces, schools, and communities. If this government is not prepared to heed the urgent call of Ontario's Muslim community, the NDP is. The need for legislative action has never been greater, and we hope that this time the government will support our efforts and pass our bill. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to acknowledge a young man from the Carleton riding who has overcome the greatest of obstacles in pursuit of his dreams. Arthur Hamlin is from the Ottawa suburb of Riverside South in the riding of Carleton. He grew up in a family where his father, grandfather, uncle, and brother all played professional football. Arthur was on his way to adding his name to that list after accepting a scholarship to Colgate University. In 2021, Arthur noticed a lump on his neck. After antibiotics prescribed by his trainers did not help. When he returned home to Ottawa, an ultrasound and biopsy confirmed his worst fears. He had cancer. He stayed home from school for a year and underwent six months of aggressive chemotherapy treatments for Hodgkin's lymphoma. He got a job at a local gym and worked out at 6 a.m. on mornings when he was able to do so. In 2022, he was cancer-free. He went back to school at Colgate and played for two more seasons while furthering his education. On Friday last week, Arthur Hamlin's dream finally came true. He played his first CFL game as a member of the Montreal Alouettes for a game at TD Place in Ottawa, the stadium where he grew up dreaming of playing in the CFL. He played in front of his family, friends, and everyone who supported him through his battle with cancer. His attitude and perseverance have inspired everyone in the Carleton riding, especially me. Thank you for being an amazing and inspirational role model. Arthur, you have made us all proud. Thank you. Member statements, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. This month, I had the pleasure of visiting Laura McIntosh and Julia Bukala's grade 10 civics class. They were amazing. I had a great chat with staff and students about the concerns they shared and what they would like to see our government do. First, they had concerns about staffing. Recently, the WRDSB announced it was laying off over 100 teachers because they faced massive budget shortfalls. Students shared concerns about bigger class sizes and less connections with adults. One ESL student said, uh, described her need for support, saying, as someone new to Canada, learning English without support staff makes her feel lost. OSSTF echoed her concerns in a recent announcement sharing that only 2.2 support staff for 1,000 students exist in secondary schools, that EAs, CYWs, and paraprofessionals are underpaid and overworked, leading to worsening issues of recruitment and retention. But students are most united in their frustration about grocery gouging. They watch their families pick up items off the sh on the shelves, look at the price and put it back. They see their families struggling to put healthy meals on the table, all while big grocery giants report record high profits. They echoed industry observers' concerns that less competition is leading to higher food costs. Students urged our government to take action to address the rising grocery prices, like endorsing the Grocery Code of Conduct, which both everyday Ontarians and the agricultural sector to have lobbied for it. Thank you, students. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the past weekend, the village of Tavstock hosted the annual World Crokinole Ch Tournament. Since 1999, players have been coming from far and wide to participate in the Crokinole Fund with both recreational 
competitive sections, the players range from the age of 7 to 90. It's truly an event for everyone. It was great to see so many families taking part in the action, enjoying local food from vendors and cheering on the competitors. There was also $6,500 in cash and prizes awarded, including a prize for the top female player. Congratulations to all this year's winners. This event is being, is, has been bringing my community of Oxford together with international coconut communities since 1999. Through the roots, has the great game can be traced to rural Ontario. I'm sure many of us have a board tucked away at the cottage or at grandma's house. Its popularity is increasing around the world every year. This year, the tournament welcomed top-ranking players from as far away as Japan, Sweden, and Australia. 25 years in, the tournament hosted more than double the number of folks who played in the inaugural tournament in 1999. I'd like to congratulate the organizers who dedicated who are dedicated to continuing this world wonderful tradition and everyone who came out to flex their crokinole muscles this weekend. We're happy to have you in Tavistock. I'm already looking forward to training for next year on my crokinole board in my basement. Thank you very much. <laughs> member statements, the member for Sarnia Lambton. To, uh... <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker. It's an honor to rise in the legislature today and form members of another important investment by this government of Ontario in the riding of Sarnia Lampton. Mr. Speaker, as part of our government's ongoing efforts to build and improve local schools, the Ontario government has provided the St. Clair Catholic District School Board with approval to issue tenders for a $3.3 million retrofit in addition at the site of the original Greg A. Hogan Catholic School on Hogan Drive in Sarnia. Once completed, this project will deliver a new, spacious gym gymnasium addition while also modernizing existing elementary space to better accommodate the needs of incoming Sacred Heart Catholic school students who will be moving to the new site upon this project completion. This investment is part of our government's ongoing commitment to provide nearly $16 billion to support school construction and repair and renewal over the next 10 years. Since 2018, the Ford government has approved or supported the development of over 300 school-related projects, including more than $24 million for a new, larger Gregory A. Hogan Catholic School on the Rapids Parkway in Sarnia. Mr. Speaker, these two projects I mentioned today are just a few of the many important investments our government is making in the future of Sarnia Lampton. I look forward to sharing more great news again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our member statements for this morning.